uh, problems, and then we would would continue on that next time, right? Uh, so it's, we're going to talk about nonparametric uh, this hour, right? So uh, let's see. If you see. Yeah, good. Okay. Okay. So here is the data, right? It's uh. It's about environmental study, right? People uh, collect sample uh, from soil and then try to check the amount of mercury in there. And these are the data, 10 pieces of data. We want to test the average amount is uh, different from 50 or not, right? Maybe 50 is a cutoff for a certain standard. So uh, you have 10 pieces of data. You want to test whether average is different from 50 or not. So what will you do then? You have a data, you want to test average amount of mercury right, in these samples is different from 50. You would, you would do a one sample t test, probably, right? So, in order to do one sample t test, you need to test normality, okay? And I said that data is normally distributed, so you would do a t test. Now, sometimes your data could be very strange, especially uh, from these. This kind of study, right? You may get one or two outliers, and your data have to totally skew. So you do a normality test, and your normality, normality test fail. If that happens, what should you do? This is a small sample, right? So if normality is not true, then you cannot use t test. So you have to find other methods. There are bootstrapping method, there are non-parametric method, and this course we talk about non-parametric methods, right? So what is non-parametric method? Non-parametric method is just a, one kind of test, test procedure that actually is less uh, restricted in distribution assumption, right? Now, in, in t-test, we say that data has to be from normal distributed population, especially for sample size small. But for non-parametric, the assumption is that the distribution is continuous. That's good enough, okay? It doesn't have to be normal. Okay, so it has that advantage. There are fewer assumptions, fewer restrictions. Okay, and a lot of time it does a be better job actually than, than than parametric tests. Right? If the data is very skewed, you'll find out sometime uh, the non-parametric test is more powerful than the parametric t test. Okay, because uh, if you use t test, you already break the violate the distribution assumption. So you're using wrong information to do your test. Of course, your test is not accurate. Right? So. Uh, there are advantage of it, and there are, of course, disadvantage of it, right? A lot of time when you do non-parametric tests, you are actually, instead of using the original data, you transform your data. You use the rank of the data. You suffer some loss of information. So your, your test may be less powerful if that test, if the data is good for a parametric test, right? Like if a test satisfies a normality assumption, you do a t-test, that t-test will be more powerful in detecting difference than non-parametric tests. But if the, the normality assumption is not true, the data is not normally distributed, your parametric, non-parametric test would a lot of time outperf outperform parametric tests. Okay. And also, for non-parametric tests, uh, if you study the exact distribution for non-parametric tests, that distribution pattern is not easy to get. Nowadays, the computing power is much better than years ago. Right? Back 20, 30 years ago, people just rely on some tables. Right? <laughs> Only table can help them solve problems. There's no computer. Now computing can calculate these exact distribution, right? SPSS and R, right? And R command are probably not unless your sample is small, right? When your sample size get large, the computation is very tedious and, and time consuming to get the actual distribution for calculating p-value, right? So, so uh, there's a disadvantage and, non and advantage of non-parametric tests there, right? But uh, Whenever your data is not normal, this is one thing that you want to consider. So the first test we want to go over is this called the Wilcoxon sign rank test, which means it involves signs and rank of the data. Okay, and uh, I, I had a note right in this DVD, right, and that's for the old lecture material, right. Since I use the web assign, uh, the, I give you different material, right, to read, and you'll find out that different book they describe these non-parametric tests in a slightly different way. The names are the same, but the way they calculate is just slightly different. The outcome will be exactly the same, right? So I'm going to stay with this notation here, right? 
uh, with the web assigns book by pack. Okay. So the sign rank test can be used for once as, as a one uh, the non-parametric alternative for one sample t test. Right. Uh, usually these tests are for testing distribution, whether distribution is different or testing the median median of a distribution that is different for a certain number or not. But if the distribution of population is symmetrical, median and mean will be the same. Okay. So if your distribution is really symmetrical, then testing median and testing mean is about the same thing. So what kind of hypothesis we may have if we're doing one sample t test or alternative for one sample t test? Generally, we test for mean equal to a certain number or not, right? No, it's the means equal to that certain number. Alternative is not equal, less than, or greater than. Okay. And when we do this test, again, like I said, there are different ways to do this. Right? In the Web of Science book, they, uh, they, they create a variable called differences. That is your data value, subtract the mean or median under null hypothesis. That will be your data to look at. Right? So before you do your analysis, you want to prepare your data. Your data will be using your data, subtract the mean under null hypothesis, and to create these DIs. Okay? And if you do pair sample, Remember, one t test can be do, used for one sample and can be used also for pair sample. Okay, for pair sample the situation, your di will be like y i minus x i. All right, so you have y variable and x variable. Okay, x is the first observation, y is the second observation, and whatnot. We can talk, talk about it in a little bit. Okay, and the assumption is these di's are continuous, not necessarily normal, just continuous. So once we have these hypotheses stated, we find those DIs. What's a test statistic in sign rank test? Test statistic for sign rank test, we use a notation S plus to denote. It's sum of positive rank. Okay, what is po sum of positive rank? I will talk about it, right? But once you have that decided, then you have critical region, right, that you can find using the tables provided in most of the book, right? They have those tables for critical region for you to make decision. Or you can actually use a p-value, compute the p-value, right? And this is what computer would do, right? Find the area to the right of the statistic or left of the statistic or the tail, smaller tail and multiply by two, the same principle as the t-test, right? But there's a distribution that your computer will calculate, the sampling distribution of this statistic uh, sign rank, okay? So uh, let's see how we do a problem like this. This is our contaminant level. What I can do is first I store these data. Okay, my null hypothesis is 50. Okay, remember when I do this, I will prepare my data. So I use x subtract 50, 50, 48 minus 50. I get those di's. All right, so negative two, negative one, and so forth. I have positive number and negative differences. Okay, then I rank these data from smallest to largest. Okay. And I add the rank for those positive numbers. So this is smallest, the second smallest, and third smallest. So the rank could be like this, right? I add out the rank for those positive numbers. And that's 3 plus 4 plus 5 plus 6 up to 10. So what do you get? 52. That's your S plus, the sign rank statistics. Okay? This statistic has a distribution. Okay? Under null hypothesis, this statistic has a distribution. Its distribution is discrete, right? For different score, it has a different tail area, but there's no score in between some of the two numbers, a whole number. That's possible, okay? Uh, in that uh, lecture material I gave you, I think they explained to you what, how to form that sampling distribution of statistics. Let's not just not worry about it, right? Under no hypothesis, there's a st sampling distribution of this S+. plus. So they use that sampling distribution to find to, to find those cutoff for different sample size, because for different sample size, there's a sample in distribution, right? Uh, it's, uh, it's different from the, the uh, z-test, okay? So you calculate the, uh, this is a very important number, right? The sign, uh, the sign rank statistic. And since we're doing a right-sided test, okay, can we find the critical region for the right-sided test? Well, look back to this first slide here. How do you find the critical region? If you do a right-sided test, critical region can be found, right, from the table C1, okay? And this actually depends on the sample size you have. Now, how many samples we have? We have 10, right? So we go to our table, 
look for, let me use, a, I, I think I have a table here. Yeah, I have, this is part of the table there, okay? Uh, I gave you this, uh, in, the, in that lecture material, you have this table, right? This is the critical value for the Coxon sign ring test. Sample size 10, right? What is a CI? My, if you have a score 44, its right tail area is 0 0.053. Means if your statistic is 50, 44, the p value is 0 0.053. Okay? But my statistic is higher than 44. So my tail area should be even smaller. If you look at the pattern of this data, you know, all right? When C score gets higher, your tail area gets smaller. That also means that your sign rank test statistic gets higher, your tail area gets smaller. So at the 44, your p-value is 0 0.053. How about at 52? In fact, we have actually exactly just a 52 there, right, for this particular example. 52, the p-value is 0 0.005. So that's it. With the table, you found the p-value, 0 0.05, right? And a lot of time, you don't get that, right? If you don't get that, but you do know that your score is higher than 44, then you know you're going to reject the null hypothesis because if the score is higher than 44, that means your p-value is less than 0 0.053. Okay, so that's how you use uh, the table to help you to solve the problem. Okay, and how to do the sign test? Again, you have your data. You use the data, subtract the null hypothesis value and the null hypothesis to get these scores, and you rank them from the smallest to the largest, right? So, uh, Smallest value, you rank it as one, second smallest rank it as two, and so forth. So that's the rank of all the data. You just add those rank for those differences that are positive and add them together. So adding these ranks together, that's your statistic. That's just that simple. It's not hard. Right? Calculating T statistic is harder than this. Right? Well, probably. It depends on how you look at it. Okay, the concept is, is easier. Okay, so that's how you do a... a sign rank test, okay? And that's one-sided one -sided test, though, right? Uh, is that one-sided test? Yeah, that's one-sided test, right? If you do two-sided two test, if this is two-sided test, then, uh, then this 47 would be a good number, right? If you have 47 or lower, then that means your p-value is, you know, two-sided test p-value will be less than 5. One-sided is 0.24. 0 0.024, two sided is almost 0 0.05, right? If your alpha level is a 5%, okay? <clears throat> and that was an example for one sample situation. Now, what if I have two sample situations? Now, this data set here is slightly different from the data set that you saw earlier. I make some uh, changes, all right? So this is slightly different. I do it in a way so that all these differences are different, okay? I realize there's a problem in the web assigned homework, right? When you do these pair sample tests, when there's a tie, the procedure is designed this way. When there's a tie, you will drop the tie, okay? So you kind of reduce the sample size. And I, I'm going to show you this example that has no tie, right? So you won't have to worry about that. But there's really a tie, right? I mean, after and before are the same value, you're going to get a zero. You will drop zero, right? If there are tie among these data, uh, hold on. There's one, actually. Oh, okay, so I didn't drop it. That's fine. But if there's a tie among these data, you're going to use the average rank, right? So let's say you have two pieces of data. It's supposed to be rank 3 and 4, but because these two numbers are the same, each, each data value is going to assign 3.5 to them. That's when you have sign a tie among these differences, right? If you have a tie among these uh, uh, after and before, you will drop that. So in this case, you will drop this one. Okay. So the you the sample size would be 11. That's right. Okay. Now, when you're doing your web assign problem, I actually contact web assign, ask them to correct that. I wonder if they can correct that or not. But some of you may receive a problem that actually has a tie and they didn't drop it. Right. So if that's the case. I found that way to, to go over that. Let's consider that tie zero as one of the value of do it, although it's incorrect, right? So, so, so hmm? zero, yeah, all right. That's what they do, but that's not the right way to do it, though. Okay. I hope you all get a data that it has no tie, 
before and after. But anyway, this is how you do it, all right? First thing you would do is find the differences, all right? So I use uh, before, minus, after. Actually, this I use before, minus, after. I get the differences, right? And then here I get the uh, rank of all these numbers from the smallest to positive. I didn't rank this one because it has a tie before and after, right? Difference is zero. So th this th piece of data is no useful uh, in comparing the, the two after and before. And so I find the positive ranks. Right, I assign rank as sign to them to help me to know that these data are positive or negative. These two are negative, so I don't care about them. Right? Only add the number with positive rank. Now, when you do the ranking, you should cover the sign. Right? Don't ignore the sign. All right? Please ignore the sign when you do the ranking. The so smallest is actually this one. Second smaller this. Third smallest is 0.3. Then the 0.4 and the 0.5. Okay. In magnitude. Okay. And so you get the uh, sum of these positive sign is uh, 50, uh, then you uh, 58, okay? Uh, what am I doing? Okay. And if you use a uh, R commander, this is output, right? You get a 52, the same thing, p value 0.004A83, okay? And of course, the decision criteria is the same as the, the one sample. It's the same thing. You're just dealing with the, the DIs, right? You prepare the data. You add the positive rank, rank sum, okay? And let's see. Uh, if you use a table in this problem, we have sample size of 11. Uh, I think I have that here. Do I have that? Uh, why am I doing this? <laughs> Okay, when the n is 11 sign rank test, uh, if you do two-sided tests, if your score is 55, okay, twice of that is 0.5 something. The next one, 56, you're going to have a, a p-value be smaller than that. So you can say if your score is actually critical value will be 55. For right side, right? For the other side, you look at the formula here. I'm sorry. Uh, if you do two sided test, the critical region will be. Um, this is not the slide that I have. Huh? Is this a slide that you have? Uh, oh, it is. So I didn't correct this one. Huh? I'm sorry about this. This part here, uh, I'm going to reproduce this one. This part here should be the same as this one here. Here, okay. For, for you having two-sided tests, you should come to your table. If alpha level is 0.05, to find a critical value, you should come to the table and look for a number that is close to 0 0.025 if you're doing two-sided tests because the alpha... 0.05. You got to use right two-sided test. Each side should be 2 point, uh, 0.025. So what you should do is look for a number that's closest to 0.025. Okay, and that would be your cutoff. This is on one side, and the other side this 66. Right? If you look at the formula, that 66 is actually the uh, uh, sample size times sample size plus one divided by two. Right? If you look at the formula, I'm sorry about flipping this. The other end will be sample size times sample size plus one divided by two. Okay. And that's actually give you the sum of all the ranks, the maximum rank, right? And subtract this, this point. So when you have, for this particular data, you have one point that is 55, that's one end point. The other end point should be 66 minus 55. That's total sample. Rank from one through 11, add them together, that's 66, right? Subtract 55, you get get the other cutout. But our statistics 58 already getting greater than 55, so I know I'm going to reject the null hypothesis if you take the critical value approach, right? But if you use the R commander, right, they give you the exact p value there. Okay. But if you took critical value approach, that that would be what you would do. Okay. Hmm. Okay, this is the result from the uh, R commander, right? You have a 58 as a score and then the p-value 0.0.
2938, right? So you reject the null hypothesis. This is actually not equal to, right? I did a two sided test. Okay. And how do you use R commander to do this? This sign rank mercury, that's actually the one, one sample case. Right, let me download that. Let me open, uh, load that thing. Oops. R commander data. Actually, that's an R data mercury. Okay. So that's the data about the contamination thing. Okay. To run this analysis, I have to prepare for that difference. So what I do is come to my data set. Uh, name is mean. Make it numeric, right? Ah, uh, what did I do? So change the variable name to mean, and then I mean the mean is 50, right? That you're testing, and then now hypothesis. It's 50. So you just enter that 50. Create a difference, just like you know, the way we did that problem. Create a difference, right? By hand, right, earlier. Then you have data ready, then click statistic, number metric, pair sample with coxin. This is actually the sine wing test for it, right? Then you use uh, your mercury content and then subtract the mean, that's the second variable. We want to, what do we do? We do want to do a right sided test, right? Greater than, oh, yeah, okay, greater than zero, right? And click OK. There's option like exact or normal approximation. Right? Exact is actually the exact distribution, discrete distribution, right? Under null hypothesis. When sample size, that distribution can be approximated so that people don't have to use table, right? A lot of table. So click OK, you get your test result. Right, that's if you use the R command. Okay. And uh, let me see the second data. I have a, this is a weight data, right? So if you download from my from my data directly, uh, there's this R R data. If you download that, load that data. View it. Yeah, it's ready. So I'm going to just run statistic, number metric, pair sample test. Pick the before minus after. If you want to use before minus after, we want to just see whether there's difference. So set it like that and click OK. If that's what you want to do, and you get the sign rank statistic and the p value. When you do the web assign problem, or try to use that material that I show you, I, I, I give you, that available on Springboard. I use that approach, or use my, my approach in this lecture right, to, to solve those problems. Okay, okay so that's a uh, sign rank test. It can be used with one sample or pair sample, just like one sample t-test can be used to one sample and pair sample. Sometimes your data comes in as a two independent sample, right? Yeah, sometimes, uh, actually, what is this? Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Actually, there is a, I just mentioned there's a large sample situation. Right, if you do have large sample, you don't have to use so many different tables to do the sign rank test, right? Just one table for a standard normal table, you can actually also approximate this test. That's when you have large sample. Okay, you can use a, you have a sine rank test, S plus, subtract the sample size times sample size plus one, divide by four, and so forth. Use this formula to calculate 
the, uh, your large sample statistic, then use a Z table to solve this sign rank test problem. That's when you have large sample. Some books say A, some books say TAM. All right, larger sample, you can use this to approximate. Okay. This is the example that I use large sample. Right. I just do the same way to calculate the sign rank statistic. Okay. And I found a sum of positive rank is 259, and then just go through it, calculate the z-score. The z-score is kind of small, right? So I don't expect I will reject the null hypothesis. P-value is pretty high. This is just regular z-test, okay, if you have large sample. So if you have two independent sample, there's also a non-parametric approach for it, okay? Uh, it's called the toxin rank sum test. Now, in some of the book or some of the software, you don't see Wilcoxon rank sum tests. You may see Man Whitney, right? Man Whitney is another group of people who de developed this test at about the same time. So they both published this result around the same time. So some people get credit for Wilcoxon, some people get credit to Man Whitney, right? So in SPSS, you probably see Man Whitney instead of Wilcoxon. Well, that's the same test. The test statistic may look slightly different. Uh, just like different books uh, describe the test in different ways, right, for non parametric especially. So uh, it's, it's the same thing. The resulting p value will be the same, okay? So here I actually have uh, the same cigarette type of data. I reduce the sample, right, so that I can manage the screen, right, and be able to uh, display the thing properly. So assuming I have, again, two types of cigarette, this is the amount of tars, and this is for a sample. Sample size, I use M just to follow the format in R Commander and, and in the, some of the books and then the WebAssign book. So sample size 1 and sample size 4. Second sample N is 5, right? So you've got to know this because that relates to how you calculate the statistic and, and find critical values. And then the way we do it, you have to prepare your data. Okay, like a sign writing test, you first use your data, subtract the mean under null hypothesis. Here what we do is using your First sample, x's. First, first sample, we call them x's. Right? That sample size for that is same. Use those, subtract the difference you like to test. Right? Want to test whether the difference of the two means is equal to a certain number or not. Here, I just want to see whether there's difference, so I use zero. Sometimes, like I said, you may want to test whether the difference is five or ten. Right? Anyway, you use the first sample, each measurement, subtract that difference you want to test. That's, you, that's how you prepare your data. Okay? And so, I, so it, for this, it's the same thing. And that rank then, this next one is rank, okay? This color, uh, the, the number is rank. Smallest is this, second smallest is this, third smallest is the rank from one, two, three, four, and so you rank them all, right? After you prepare the data, this is actually the original data, you prepare it, it's the same because you're subtracting zero, so you're not changing them, okay? And you rank them all, and then your statistic it's the sum of these x i minus z minus that whatever difference you like to test, the rank of this. Okay. So this is actually the test procedure. Your hypothesis is a general hypothesis. Earlier I used d, right? This is here I use data. This stands for the same thing. I tried to use a notation that web assigned book use. Okay. And your test statistic again, you see, it's a sum of rank of those x i minus that difference you like to test among all the values, right? Either the x minus data or y's, all the values, okay? And then add them up, right, the sum of those. And your test statistic, critical region, again, these are the information that you can find from the book. There's a Wisconsin uh, rank sum test distribution book. The CI, you can find the critical region for it, right? And the idea is very similar to that rank test, okay? So here, oops. Here is the version. I just look at the section that has M is 4 and N is, uh, let me show you the, uh, the table. I have a copy of this. This is a copy of it. Right? The Coxon ring sum test. They give you M, right? They give you N, and this column is C. So M is 4, right? And N is 5. So look at M4, N5, right? This is what I actually cut and paste into the, 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 doc, the, the PowerPoint. So there's four and five, right? So what we need to know is actually five, right? Okay. 
if you look at this one, this is a 27, this is close to 0.05. So if you're doing one-sided test, right-sided test, if your statistics is greater than 27, you'll reject the null hypothesis. In fact, if you have a 28, your rank sum is 28, you're going to reject the null hypothesis. P-value is going to be 0 0.032. Okay. And then so forth. Now, we are doing two-sided tests. So this could be one of the cutoff because the next one will be actually past the 0 0.025, right? So you can say if my statistic is greater than 28, that's on one side, or statistic is less than the total minus 28, right? So that's actually, this is one end, right? Total is 4 times uh, 4 plus 5 plus uh, 1. This is m time m plus n plus 1, right? And minus 28, which is this score here. Minus C. Okay. Try to relate that to the formula. I said that's this one. If you're doing two-sided tests, you, know, you look at that C, and also look for n times n plus n plus one. This whole thing divided by two minus that C. The C is the 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 half of the confidence le uh, level of significance you found, right? I mean, critical value from half of the le level of significance you found from the table. Okay. So that's how I find these two points. 28, that's right side of the cutout. And 12 is the m times n plus n plus 1. Oh, do I have to divide by 2? Hmm. m times n. I don't think I have to divide it by 2. Hmm. Anybody has a copy of that uh, that note for non-parametric? I never memorized this, right? So, <laughs> uh, but anyway, if you look at that note, they give you this. So I, I think I probably typed it wrong. Okay, but anyway, you can find these two cutoff. These are the critical region. I right? specify the critical region, so you can actually find it. Not this note, though. The the uh, the uh, the uh, Study material. Okay. But if you use the R commander, they will they will give you this. Okay. This is the result from subtracting the M plus M plus one over two. Okay. The R like I said, you know, in different Textbook, a different way people try to, when they try, to, not this one. The, uh, this is the full one. No, the, not this yeah. one. The, uh, the, the study material oh, from the book. Okay. Yeah, thanks, though. Thanks, though. Okay. From our commander, they give you a statistic four. Okay. The difference between that and our statistic, our statistic is this W. We correct, we have to correct it by subtracting M plus M plus one divided by two, right? So our statistic was 14. We subtract that, we get the 4. So like I said, different book, or different people, when they describe this, they made this slightly different. Like our commander, they, they, when they do this, they use a slightly different statistic. So their sampling distribution will be slightly different from this. But the end results are the same. Okay? And for our class, let's not worry about how R calculated. Just follow our textbook, right? I mean, the, uh, the web of science book. That's good enough. Okay? Our commander will give you the p-value. You trust that p-value. That's the same thing. The statistics look like different, right? But the, the p-value will be the same since they are the same test. Okay? Am I, am I making sense? Everybody follow? Okay. When I talk about that textbook, I was talking about uh, something else. All right, let me, uh, let me take you to that textbook. Uh, I apologize for this. Uh, mm -hmm. I may have it. You see, I probably have that here. Uh, 
No, not there. Uh, let me see. So none of you bring a copy of that textbook, right? The number metric one. Anybody downloaded a copy on your computer? There is a there's a study material from web in. Uh, let me see. Let me do it very quickly, just to make sure that we're doing the right thing, right? Let me uh, go there very quickly. Uh, springboard. There's a non-parametric distribution uh, three test. Remember this one? Well, how do we get to oh, here? Ah. Did you read this book? Do you know what I'm saying? From the spring, I think I, did, I don't know whether I sent you a copy of this or not. But, oh, that's without dividing my half. All right. So my it's, my uh, note there, actually, that was just last night. Right. <laughs> last night I did not decide to do this, so I didn't finish until I passed midnight. So I didn't didn't actually I did a lot of copy and paste. And uh, I missed this one. There's no divide by two, okay? There, okay. So, so uh, I will correct it though, right? Over here in the formula, there is no divided by two, right? So we need to take that off, okay? Okay, good. So th this is correct, right? When I did it, I, it was correct. But I tried to do a copy and paste, and I missed that. Okay. Okay. So this is a Wilcoxon rank sum test. Right. Uh, do it with R commander. Do I have that? Yeah, I do have the data there. So the data was entered, right? Those nine pieces of data. You know how to do this. This is the same as creating data for two independent sample tests, right? So that's not a big deal. And click statistic, non parametric test, and uh, Two sample with coxin tests, okay, and then it's all set up because cigarette type is already categorical, right? And if you want to do two-sided tests, it's two-sided tests already. So what you need to do is just click, okay, you got the result. It's just that simple, right? With the software, it's so quick, right? But remember, this statistic is slightly different, right? It's shifted, right? Slightly different from the the statistic that we use, that we calculate. It, it, this one will based on a shifted distribution. Right? Distribution is slightly different from others. But the, since they are talking about the same test, the statistic will be the p value will be exactly the same. Okay, you find that in the number metric tests. Okay, there's really not a uniform you know, or, or common uh, approach, right? but the result is the same. Different people prefer different approach. Right? That's unfortunately that's the case. And there's a large sample formula too. If you do have large data, I can use a Z test for it. So Z test to approximate. So you calculate your W statistic, subtract this number. This is the mean of this, right? This is standard deviation. Of this statistic, and you can, then rest of it will be like a Z test, regular Z test. Okay. Okay. So that's a two independent sample T test. Now, if I have multiple sample, there's so-called a Kruskal-Wallis test for it. Okay, multiple sample. Those, that's a non-parametric alternative for ANOVA, one-way ANOVA app test. Okay, and I use uh, that smoking right the example that we did earlier. And uh, the first step you do, you rank all the data. You have four samples of data, right? Rank all the data from the smallest to the largest. So smallest is 4.7, you rank as 1. Second smallest is 2, 
and 5.4 is 3, right? Then you see there are some numbers that are the same. You see this 10.5, 10.5, 10.5, 10.5. That's because we have four pieces of 6.2, right? When you reach that, you should have a 9 and 10 and 11 and 12. But because all these four pieces are the, de are the same, so we use the average rank of these four, which is 10.5. So I assign these four pieces of data each at the same rank, 10.5. That's what I mean earlier. If you have tie, use a mid rank. Okay, that's what people do. But unfortunately, in some of the software, our commander probably have that situation. If you do have ties, right, they will give you a strange outcome there. Right? They don't really have exact distribution to deal with it. Right? So they will give you some messages about it. Anyway, that's how you prepare your rank first. Right? Once you have those rank calculated, this is your statistic. Look kind of ugly, right? But this RI is the rank sum of the I sample. So for each sample, you have those ranks, right? You sum these ranks. So the, at the end, these are the rank sum. This is the rank sum for the first sample, second sample, third sample, fourth sample. These are those are RIs. So to calculate these statistics, each of those rank sum, you square them, divide by the sample size for that sample, do that for all the groups. Since we have four groups, do that for all those four groups and add them together. That's, mean, that's the meaning of that. Summing all these rank sum squared divided by sample size. And multiply that with the 12 over sample size. This n is total sample size, right? Time total sample size plus 1. Once you got this number, then you subtract 3 times of total sample size plus 1. That's the formula for this Kruskalis statistic. That's a shortcut formula, right? The defining formula is this. From, you, from here, you will see it's measuring the variation of those. Ri bar is the average rank for each, each group. So it's trying to measure the variability between average ranks right, for these three groups. Right? If the variability is large, that means that these four groups different is significant. Okay? This statistic as sample size get large follow a chi-square distribution. Chi-square is a different distribution. Right? It's a skew distribution, and chi-square distribution has a degrees of freedom, like t. Right? This degrees of freedom is sample size minus 1. So we have k group, suppose, then the, the, this H statistic has a distribution that's chi-squared with degrees of freedom k minus 1. So I have four groups, the degrees of freedom is 3. Okay. So if you have large sample, that you can use a chi-squared distribution table. That's actually uh, among the tables uh, that I give you. Uh, let me just try to find that one. And also the Pagano's book has that chi-squared table too. Right. Uh, this is actually, oops. Uh, Elmo, this is a table from Pagano's, right? And most of the chi-square tables look like this, right? You have a right tail area, you have degrees of freedom. We have degrees of freedom three, okay? And uh, so degrees of freedom three at 0.05 level, the critical value is 7.81. All right, so you can actually use that it's a critical value to make decision if you if you just care whether it passed 0.05 or not. Okay. And uh, if you look back to the our computation, this is using that formula to calculate the the, uh, the Chris Wallace statistic. It's 13.324, right? And degrees of freedom is three. So if you look back to this table, degrees of freedom three, 13 point something. That's in between these two numbers. So its p-value is between 0 0.01 and 0 0.001. So you can use that to kind of approximate uh, what kind of p-value this statistic is going to give you. It's around between 0 0.01 and 0 0.001. Okay, and you know that it's less than 0 0.05, so I just need to reject the null hypothesis. Okay. Does it make sense? All right, so that's a kruskal wallace test. That's a non-parametric test for... for uh, for multi-sample situation, multi-parametric alternative for a one-way ANOVA test. Right? This is a table from uh, from the Web of Science book, right? And it has the same thing. Okay, degrees of freedom three, same point a one five. It's the same thing, right? Right tail area 0.05. If you want to find a critical value. 
if you want to find the uh, p value, it can only approximate. 13 actually is beyond, uh, between, uh, beyond actually 12.8. Right, so actually, the p value is less than 0 0.005. Okay, so these two tables give you slightly different information, right? But uh, the end result's about the same, right? Any question? Do you have any question? So this is a non-parametric test, right? I'm going to go back and correct this note right, for that two independent sample tests. Any question? Did I go to? Yes. I have a question. Yes. Okay. Every time I put every time I put that into SPSS to run it, I get a different p value. I get point seven one three. No matter what I do. Okay, sign test, huh? Okay. Uh, let me I don't know how you did it. Maybe maybe after class we can spend some time uh, do a, a Skype, right? So I can see what you did. But uh, I also have another advice that is the the sign sign test, not sign rank test, right? Sign test generally is, yeah, generally sign test is not the preferred test as a non-parametric alternative for t-test because sign test, you only assign signs, positive negative signs to those data, okay? So the, the difference in magnitude between data value, that kind of information is not given. So comparing sign test and sign rank test, most of people will use sign rank test instead of sign test. In the, in the old note, I just show that all right, to give you additional information about different tests that sometimes people try. Okay, but well, in practice, well, on yes. On SPSS, you can do it binomial. Yes, bion you binomial test. Binomial. Yes, that's yes. right. Yeah, I think I have that in the SPSS uh, reference uh, page, my SPSS instruction page. Uh, I have video for that too. Yeah. You don't get the right answer, right? It's it's a setup. There is a place that you should set the cutoff. If you do have a medium value, set a cutoff. Okay, set a cutoff at 50. If you're trying to do this a contamination, mercury contamination problem, right? Set a cutoff. Okay, not comparing zero, but comparing with other value. Right? Okay, but I I, in practice, I would recommend you to use a sign rank test instead of sign test. Okay. In fact, uh, I think last slide, I have another little slide, right? Uh, let me see. Okay, uh, let me, wow, forgot that I have a few more. Right? So this is the outcome from what Cox and some tests here. I mean, the uh, 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 Kruzko Wallace test. Actually, Kruzko Wallace test is an extension of what Cox and Rank some tests, all right? You can use this for what Cox and Rank some tests, I mean, two independent sample, you get the same result. But here I actually have some so-called relative efficiency for these uh, comparing t-tests with Cox and Ring sum tests. Right? Uh, this kind of tell us uh, the power of these two tests when we apply them in different underlying distribution. Okay. Uh, we mentioned that power is related to sample. The larger sample size you have, the higher the power is. Right. So people actually use this to actually compare different test statistics for the same purpose. Like we have Wilcox and Rain sum tests and two independent sample t tests for comparing two samples. Right? And we have this so called relative efficiency telling us that if our underlying distribution is uniform, then N2 is a sample size for t tests and Wilcox and Rain sum tests, sample size N1. If we compare these two tests, right? Relative efficiency is one. That means if you have same sample size, okay, these two tests will achieve the same power. So that you have relative efficiency. You have efficiency one. If you're if you're using the data, using the test on normally distributed data, uh, the Wilcox and Ring sum tests only have 0.95 efficiency uh, in compared with uh, parametric t tests. Well, because t tests are designed for normal distribution. So if you do have normal distribution, your t-test will have a better power than Wilcox and Rain sum test. Right? So you will require more data 
what we Cox and Wing sum test to achieve the same power as t test when the data is normally distributed. All right. Now, if you have data that is Laplace or other distribution, you'll find out that your non-parametric tests become more powerful, more efficient than the parametric t test. So, if you have Laplace or exponential or these other distribution, you will require more data for your t test to achieve the same power as non-parametric tests. Okay, so this is some term, some some uh, information that sometimes people use to compare different tests. Right? We have non-parametric alternative. I have p t test. Which one is more efficient? Which one is more powerful in different distribution? Okay, so giving a sense, right? How do you compare different type of tests? You may have other tests developed in the future. You want to compare with the parametric t test, right? People can study these information to help you. To, understand which one is more powerful. Right? I don't know whether what I said is making sense to you or not, right? but there's this information that sometimes people use right? uh, for studying, for comparing different tests. But just to tell you that uh, if you have data that's normally distributed, it's better you use t-test because t-test is going to have higher power in detecting difference. If you have data that's not normally distributed, especially if it's very skewed, and you'd be better off try non-parametric instead of t-test because non-parametric test is going to have better power in detecting the difference. Okay, that's really what I want to say all right, from this slide. Okay, so I think is that about.